Here's a crazy investing fact. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway stock could drop 99.99% and it still would have outperformed the S&P 500. Beating the S&P 500 is something that most of the hedge funds don't even accomplish. To use real numbers, if you would have invested $10,000 in the S&P 500 in 1983, today you would have about $262,000. A pretty nice return. However, and you can guess where I'm taking this, if you would have invested $10,000 in Berkshire Hathaway in 1983, you would have $5.38 million, all from just sitting on your rump. In this video, we'll explore the alchemy of Warren Buffett, the principles that he uses to find companies that will 10X, 20X over time, and how you can do the same. Welcome friends, if you're new to the channel, which I'm guessing you are, my name is David, and I am currently looking for companies to deploy $100,000 of my own money into. I'll be using the techniques of Warren Buffett and other legendary investors to help guide my decisions. I search for the companies that I will ultimately invest in. I have the money parked in a high yield savings account, collecting 5% interest to combat inflation. I made a whole video explaining my thought process behind this. If you'd like to check it out, there's a link above. To find 10 baggers, there are six major qualities that you must look for in a company. And to make this more tangible, I'll use Nvidia as an example, who has been on an absolute tear recently, almost tripling in value over the past 12 months. Let's see if it's still a buy. Hey Ruthie. One of the first things we need to look for when we're looking for a company to see if it'll 10X is to see if it has good long-term prospects. Peter Lynch, a legendary investor that had an annualized return of 29.2% from 1977 to 1990, once said, the real key to making money in stocks is to not get scared out of them. If you're aiming to find a company that will 10X, you need to make sure you don't sell it when it doubles. The reciprocal also cannot happen. What if the stock drops 90% after you take your initial position? How can you ride both of these scenarios out confidently. It is beyond easy to get emotional in both cases. And in investing, emotion is the enemy. To override our very human emotion, you need to understand the business and you need to understand the company's long-term prospects. We do this through research and due diligence, and this culminates in an investing thesis. An investing thesis is a well-reasoned argument for why a stock is a good or bad investment and what you believe the fair value of the company is. So long as your thesis is grounded in reality, it can guide you through the volatile ups and downs of the market. And also when the reverse is true or when times are good, it gives you an indication that one of your stocks may be fully priced and it might be time to think about selling or at least time to review our thesis and make an updated fair value estimation. Looking at this concept through the lens of NVIDIA, I know that they are a industry leader in the graphics processing units, GPUs, which are used in video games and that their technology is essential for many of the large language models that we're seeing in AI. It seems 2023 has been the starting gun to the AI revolution. So my first thought is that NVIDIA has strong long-term prospects. But to really understand the long-term prospects of NVIDIA, I need to do more research. And to do our research properly, we need to understand the business of the company that we're looking to invest in. This is a sine qua non. We must understand the business. And that means we have to also understand the industry and the sector, which coincidentally is the next quality we're looking for in an investment. Our circle of competence is the amalgamation of our experiences and knowledge. It represents the boundary of the businesses that we can currently understand. The breadth of our circle is determined by a variety of factors, including our profession, spending habits, hobbies, economic class, friend groups, etc. We always want to look for edges as investors, and understanding our circle of competence is one of our best edges against Wall Street. Our circle of competence, in my opinion, is less about what you know and more about knowing what you do not know. This requires humility. Let's get legendary investor Charlie Munger's thoughts on how he determines his circle of competence. Full disclosure, he's old as shit, but it doesn't take away the fact that he has one of the most impressive track records of any investor. I want to think about things where I have an advantage over other people. I don't want to play a game where the other people have an advantage over me. So if you have a pharmaceutical company and you're trying to guess what new drug is going to be invented, I've got no advantage. Other people are better than that than I am. I don't play in a game where the other people are wise and I'm stupid. I look for a place where I'm wise and they're stupid. And believe me, it works better. God bless our stupid competitors. They make us rich. You know? so that's, that's my philosophy. And, it's, and, I, and I, I think you have to know the edge of your own competency. You have to kind of know what, this is too tough for me. I'll never figure this out. I'm very good at knowing when I can't handle something. Okay, turning to NVIDIA, and of course we're gonna do this on flank. 
If I look at the information technology sector, and you can see NVIDIA has come in on a complete tear for this whole sector, we can see that there are three industries that make up the information technology sector, and that is semiconductors, communication, and technology. We're talking about circle of competence, and I work in technology as part of my day job, but I work on the software side. And so I mostly fall into this technology category, but most software companies fall within this. And NVIDIA would be a pure hardware company. And so my circle of competence is close to NVIDIA, but I would say that it does fall outside of it. I can get NVIDIA into my circle of competence, but that will require a decent bit of legwork. We could double click into the semiconductor industry to get a better sense of some of the competitors that we should evaluate for. I have a basic understanding of how most semiconductors are set up. They design the chips and outsource the manufacturing to a company called TSMC. I know that NVIDIA has been responsible for many video game innovations. I know they're helping power the AI revolution, but where I think I have some serious gaps in my circle of competence is mostly around the competitive landscape. Does AMD, Intel, or even Apple have plans to start manufacturing more GPUs? I know the US recently passed the CHIPS Act, which will see a huge investment in semiconductor manufacturing. There's a lot of things that push this pretty far outside of my circle of competence. So overall, I'd say NVIDIA gets a meh on my circle of competence. I don't think it would take too much heavy lifting for me to get strong enough on the industry to come up with a with a relatively reasonable thesis, but it's not directly in my circle of competence. As I continue to scope out the company, if I see things that I really like, I will invest the time in getting it inside my circle of competence. I need to, again, make sure that we understand that we cannot take an investment if the company is outside our circle of competence. You won't have the confidence required to ride the highs and lows of the company. Okay, so how do you find your circle of competence? You can start with getting familiar on the various sectors. Warning, here comes a shameless plug to flank. Okay, we'll go on to the flank. We'll go into guided research. And you can see right here that we custom made a circle of competence video. You can select which sectors you're very good at. I'm good at technology, so, and uh, let's add another one. Consumer discretionary, because I, I shop. And ratios, uh, I'm not gonna filter by that right now, but you can see an explanation of everything above. And then metrics, uh, I'm not gonna do metrics either. And here, you can see companies that are possibly in your circle of competence. It's kind of cool. This is just version 1.0, so, when we get feedback from alpha testers, we can continue to iterate and make this a better product that we all love. So overall, I would assess NVIDIA as, as outside of my circle of competence. A company like Apple uh, would be pretty well within my circle of competence. It's an easy to understand business. I use and love their products. I understand their various sources of revenue. I, I understand the business. A company like Pfizer is is very far outside of my circle of competence. It would take a Herculean effort for me to understand the core components of this business and what will drive it to long-term success. This is why you won't see me investing in biopharma. After I've assessed that a company is within my circle of competence, one of the best ways to have confidence in a company's long-term prospects after you're sure that you understand the business is to understand who's behind the wheel, who's the leadership of the company. I look for strong leaders who have a proven track record and can navigate through both calm and stormy waters. One of the very best books I read on this subject was William Thorndike's The Outsiders. While I highly recommend it, some of the key takeaways are, well, it turns out that I went through this entire section and then realized that I didn't hit the play button. So, and if you want to see my reaction, here it is. Oh, shit, I'm still recording. Oh, fuck. And so without further ado, I'll go ahead and get the next part going. Okay, some of the cool things about The Outsiders by William Thorndike, that he proposes that a CEO's performance should not just be based on revenue growth and profit margins, but that his job should be on per share value creation, especially when compared against peers. His second main point is that capital allocation is the CEO's most important role. He goes on to give various examples. He tells the story through the lens of eight different CEOs, and the book made me rethink the purpose of a CEO entirely. It helped me understand the importance of the CEO in creating value for shareholders. So the next logical question is, how do we evaluate company leadership? And we'll search for NVIDIA, and we have a whole a whole section on their governance. We created a buy and sell table 
for insider transactions so you can see how executives are either buying or selling. I'll go into why I wanna see insider transactions later, but just to quickly give insight, insiders will sell for any reason, to diversify their funds, to you know buy something new in their personal life, pay alimony for a divorce, etc. The real thing you wanna look for is when an insider buys. So to me, that's a very strong buying signal. But to get back to the point on how to evaluate company leadership, we list out each one of their C-suite members, and you can see how much they're compensated, how long they've been in that position, and their age. And you have a Google link that will take you to the page, and you can look at the various things that the CEO has done. And this can help you build your understanding of their background, history, their thoughts, their vision, where they wanna take the company. You wanna get a good sense of their personality and, and where they think the company belongs. Another thing I'll do that's not baked into flank, but I will also look up the CEO plus any controversies that the CEO is enwrapped in. It's impossible to do a good deal with a bad person. And so I wanna make sure before I trust someone with my money that I can actually trust the individual. I found overall when I treat researching a company's leadership like it's a job interview, like I'm about to hire the CEO, I, I ask myself, would I, like, would I want this person to work for me? And that helps me narrow down if I actually want to take a position in the company. I like that he has a master's degree from Stanford University in electrical engineering. I like that he ranks relatively low as the highest paid CEOs. And it's because he has 3.6% of the company, which gives him a personal net worth of $38 billion, So he doesn't need to draw a salary. But I still like to see that nonetheless. Overall, I really like NVIDIA's leadership. They get two thumbs up. Okay, next thing we look at is the financial health of a company. This is one of the most intensive parts of our analysis. Uh, like I said, I, I do take a first glance before I decide if I'm gonna deep dive a company. Uh, but on my first glance, some things I look at are healthy cash flows, manageable debt, and a robust return on equity, which I believe are all hallmarks of a company in good financial shape. But I, I gotta be honest, this is, this is a very complex topic. I will make an entire video on this in the future, but at an extremely high level, I want to understand how a company is growing revenue and managing costs. I also want to understand their capital structure, uh, how much debt they have versus how much equity they have to to finance their growth initiatives. I also want to understand what those growth initiatives, those growth growth and growth, those growth initiatives are. That was a difficult word to say. Yeah, I also need to understand the economics of the business. So how are their margins and how all this relates to their comparables and competitors. If you want to really go deep on this topic and understand what Warren Buffett looks for, there's this fantastic book called Warren Buffett and the Interpretation of Financial Statements that does a wonderful job going into exactly what Warren Buffett looks for in a company. I would say this is a intermediate level investor book. So if you're just getting started, I have some other recommendations and can do a video on the best uh, books I've read if that's something that you would be interested in. Let me know in that comment section. But let's take a quick glance using Flank. Okay, so we're in the company's income statement. I have to plug my company. So not only are we gonna give you what their income statement is, we're going to break it up into each of the line items. Uh, and we will tell you what it is and why is it important. And we'll do that for each one of these. So you can see, and so this allows you to see how the revenue, how NVIDIA's revenue has been growing over the last couple of years. And you can see that that they've done a great job. I mean, they had a 21.3% increase from quarter two. What's more is we'll also get, uh, assign an importance value. So when you're going through, you can you understand that your income tax expense isn't nearly as important as your gross profit or your revenue or your gross profit margin. But moving on, this allows you to understand the various things of, of, of NVIDIA. And so I wanna see their revenue uh, and I wanna compare it against their chief competitor, AMD. And so we can see here that there's a, they're both growing at similar rates. AMD does seem to be growing, had grown quicker, or started from less. But in recent years, you've seen, you've seen them really, you've seen NVIDIA pull away. Moving on to their gross profit margin, you can see that NVIDIA has way stronger margins. 
All right, I'm gonna scope this back to just NVIDIA. I like that their book value, which is total assets minus total liabilities is still very much so positive with their, you know, the total assets being about 44 billion and total liabilities being 20 billion, given their book value, 24 billion. And then one thing I would wanna look at more is their cash flow statement. It seems that their change in cash has changed pretty drastically over the last couple of years. So I, I wanna take a, a close look at this. But that's a super high level look at at the at Nvidia's financial health. I assess it as as a pretty financially healthy company. However, there's one major thing about Nvidia, and that is their PE ratio. The PE ratio or the price to earnings ratio is how much the market values your earnings. It basically is an indicator on how expensive a stock is. A general rule of thumb is anything over 20 is an expensive stock. Anything less than 20 should be considered in value territory. I think the more useful indicator is to gauge it against the S&P 500. One of the major things that we need to talk about about NVIDIA is their price to earnings ratio. So NVIDIA is currently sitting at about 226, while the S&P 500 is sitting at about 28. Uh, and that gives me the impression that NVIDIA is very expensive stock. It's okay if it's a young company for the PE ratio to be very high because it's not inconceivable for them to 10X their earnings in the next 10 years, which in the case of NVIDIA would drop it from 226 to 22.6, putting it closer to that you know value range. But 226 times for an old company is very expensive stock. And that really does put me at a pause here because it is very difficult for me to justify a 226 PE ratio. So I'm excited by what NVIDIA has to offer, but honestly at, the, at this valuation, I cannot justify taking a position. And so I won't be moving to deep dive the company's financials or really going into my due diligence process because the stock is just too expensive. High level of research has, has indicated to me that that analysts currently value the entire microchip market at about $25 billion. Uh, it is one of the fastest growing industries in our market. And so it could be up to 350 billion by 2033. Even if Nvidia cornered the entire market, it's still hard to justify their $1 trillion valuation. What the market is pricing in here is that they will find another vertical to pursue. Most speculators are assuming that it will come from the AI demand. That's not a crazy thought, but if you bake this into your thesis, what is your upside? It's one thing for us to have bought this three years ago at $150, at $150 a share, but to justify a new position. The last thing I would look for if I were to continue researching NVIDIA, this would I would probably only be about 10% through my analysis at this point. A durable competitive advantages are simple in nature, but they are tricky to identify. Buffett refers to these as moats. He basically argues that by the very nature of capitalism, competitors will repeatedly attempt to assault any business castle that is earning high returns. Thus, he looks for companies with formidable barriers, which could come in the case of being a low cost producer, in the case of Geico or Costco, or possessing a worldwide brand such as Coca-Cola or Gillette. There are certainly other moats that exist, such as network effects, switching costs, a culture of innovation, et cetera. I really wanna just reiterate that the that the search for the competitive advantage would be a, a long leg in this analysis, along with the financial health check, but because of that PE ratio, I did steer clear. In future videos, I will highlight both of those things way closer. And also this video is getting kind of long, but to sum it up, that's it. In order to find a company that will 10X in value the way Warren Buffett and other legendary investors do, you need to understand the business enough to come up with a investing thesis. This is simple, but it is not easy. I'll conclude with, uh, with a 1987 letter from Warren Buffett. He writes, Charlie and I look for companies that A, have business that we understand, B, favorable long-term economics, C, able and trustworthy management, and D, a sensible price tag. We like to buy the whole business or if management is our partner, at least 80%.
When control type purchases of quality aren't available though, we are happy to simply buy a small portion of great businesses by way of stock market purchases. It's better to have a part interest in the Hope Diamond than to own all of a rhinestone. The rest of this quote contains great insight into how Berkshire Hathaway evaluates durable competitive advantage along with leadership. Uh, you can find it in the description. And so to finish up, I will not be taking a position in NVIDIA at this time based on their very high cost. I hope you found this video helpful and be sure to follow along closely so when we do find a company that we want to take to that next level of our due diligence process, you can see what that looks like. We'll catch you next time.